It's believed two gunmen wearing balaclavas walked into the front bar of the Brunswick Club on busy Sydney Road about 6.30 last night. They approached Moran and long-time colleague Herbert Rout and opened fire with a shotgun and a pistol, killing Moran and wounding Rout before fleeing on foot. Channel 9 News reenacts the gangland killing of Lewis Moran. Usually these little drama productions rely on a few amateur performers plucked from the newsroom. But the bloke at the bar is the spitting image of Lewis. So where did Nine find its lead? On the front page of the Herald Sun. Through the miracle of cut and paste, Channel Nine put Lewis Moran's head into their little drama. No wonder the Melbourne crime boss looked surprised as he was plugged all over again. Welcome to Media Watch. I'm David Maher. Earlier today, Macquarie Radio tried to bump us off, but here we are after all. Alan Jones' Sydney station did not want us to discuss in any way an Australian Broadcasting Authority document leaked to us last week. It's a feisty draft report of the ABA's investigation into Telstra's sponsorship of Jones' breakfast show and the near miraculous conversion of Jones from critic to warm friend of the mighty telco. The document really makes you wonder if the ABA ever had the ticker to take on the nation's most influential broadcaster. Last week, I said... So how was Jones' conversion achieved? It's the absolutely fundamental question in all this, but not a question the ABA answers or even explores. But I was wrong. The leaked document prepared last December proves that question was explored at length and in such vivid detail that it's hard to understand why the ABA board decided in the end to exonerate all parties without further investigation. When we asked the ABA about the report late in the week, they too threatened us with an injunction and alerted Jones, Telstra and Macquarie Radio. Meanwhile, the authority's general manager, Giles Tanner, briefed us about the preparation of the report. Basically, this work was done inside the legal and policy team of the ABA. By what Tanner described as... Junior and middle levels of the staff body. Reporting to him and the ABA's chief lawyer, John Quill Ritter. They were not happy with the direction of the report and Tanner confirmed that neither was the silverback chair of the ABA, David Flint. By this time, Flint had already told Media Watch that Jones was in the clear. There is nothing that would indicate any breach of standards or the code. After that appearance on Media Watch, Flint told his amazed colleagues that this comment was an honest mistake, but he left his personal vindication of Jones uncorrected on the public record. Weeks later in December, he found himself reading this draft report that was very far from clearing Jones. It contained a sharp analysis of the techniques Jones used to fend off commentary hostile to Telstra's interests on his breakfast show. On the limited occasions when alternative viewpoints were expressed by callers to the program, Mr Jones did not allow such viewpoints to remain unchallenged and, in effect, denied or undermined their opportunity to be heard. As a result, the ABA investigators had made a preliminary finding that Macquarie Radio had breached the broadcasting codes by not making reasonable efforts or allowing reasonable opportunities for significant viewpoints on controversial issues of public importance concerning Telstra to be presented. Another uncomfortable surprise for Flint must have been a second preliminary finding that Macquarie Radio had breached the codes by allowing Jones to broadcast this in October 2002. You would have read for some weeks now that because one rather unworthy media outlet chronicled that I was on the payroll of Telstra, then that became received wisdom right across the country. Every newspaper across the country printed it. And of course it is designed to damage. And of course I've never had a cent from Telstra in my life. The ABA investigators were concerned that Jones listeners couldn't judge what weight to give this claim. His listeners couldn't know how intimately he was involved with Telstra in negotiating the deal and in the day-to-day -day broadcasting of his show, nor that... There was a significant increase in Mr Jones's salary when he moved to 2GB, which appears, at least in part, to have resulted directly from his ability to attract Telstra's sponsorship. And what was the sponsorship deal really all about? 
not just buying ads, according to this consultant's email to Telstra Marketing. I know there are non-media reasons for signing this deal, but we really need to stress that this does not represent value and we are paying more than we estimate market rates to be for this airtime. The December report found, essentially, that Telstra, Jones and Macquarie had found a way around the cash for comment rules. The available evidence suggests that the key parties, that is Macquarie Radio Network, Telstra and Alan Jones, structured the commercial agreement of 17 July 2002 to fall outside the regulatory requirements of the Act so that they were free to act, albeit carefully, in a manner inconsistent with the policy objectives of the Act, insofar as transparency, accountability and fairness were concerned. But note those words, available evidence. The ABA investigators wanted and needed more evidence. A decision had been made somewhere at the top of the ABA that this would be a documents-only investigation. But how could the ABA investigators pin down the conversations and understandings which they suspected were at the heart of the Telstra deal by only looking at documents? For instance, Telstra had wanted a written guarantee that Jones would stop doing what he'd been doing for years, putting the boot into Telstra. Macquarie Radio refused to give it, but the December draft observed... In light of the warm relationship that developed between Macquarie, Jones and Telstra executives and the corresponding level of support for Telstra that Jones broadcast in his programs after July 2002, questions arise concerning whether or not Telstra's intention was eliminated altogether or merely converted to a request or an understanding between the parties. Exactly. And the December draft can be read as a plea by the investigators to be allowed to pursue those questions. How? By using the ABA's power to summon Jones and those executives involved in the Telstra deal to attend before a delegate of the ABA to answer questions on oath. It's not uncommon. Last year, Jones was examined on oath, in private, to solve the riddle of his ownership of Macquarie Radio. But the ABA was not going to let anyone be grilled about the Telstra deal. After Flint and his general manager saw the December draft report, it was decided there was no point pursuing, let alone expanding, the investigation. Tanner told Media Watch he found... A fair bit of barking up the wrong tree and tendentious tone in places that really wasn't warranted by anything that we had or would be likely be able to get. Tanner felt the board would rather discuss the adequacy of current regulations than... Pursue so many rabbits down holes. So the report leaked to Media Watch never reached the board. It's not clear if anyone from the board, other than Flint, actually read the thing. Tanner told Media Watch a report taking a very different direction went to the board in January. There were then more changes. Because the board actually had a lot to do with the final shape of the report, and a lot of views. The ABA's verdict on Jones and the Telstra deal emerged finally a couple of weeks ago. The Telstra deal got a big tick and the vindication of Alan Jones was now official. Among the many unanswered questions we sent the ABA late last week was this. Is it appropriate for Professor Flint to be involved in this investigation after expressing and allowing his prejudgment of the investigation to be published? We analysed the ABA's published report at length on Media Watch last week. But now we also have the December draft in our hands we can see what was lost when the fresh direction was mandated before Christmas. Documents went, arguments disappeared. The Jones story was boiled down to bare bones. The final verdict is much, much friendlier to Jones than the leaked document. Before Christmas, the plain fact that he ran an overwhelmingly Telstra-friendly show spelt trouble for Macquarie Radio. The December draft reversed the facts to argue the principle. If 95% of airtime is anti-Telstra and only 5% pro-Telstra, it might be inferred that reasonable efforts had not been made to present significant viewpoints. But in the final reckoning, the ABA said the only effort Jones had to make was to invite listeners to comment from time to time. The invitation was enough. He didn't even have to put them to air. In the absence of any evidence that the producer of the programme filtered out negative calls or that callers with different viewpoints were cut off more quickly than callers who agreed with Mr Jones, the ABA cannot find a breach of the code. At times, the final report descends to making excuses for Jones. The ABA said it was arguably misleading of him to claim on air that he'd never had a cent from Telstra, but... 
He was, with some emotion, defending himself against the specific allegation that he was on the Telstra payroll. Somehow they thought it went to Jones' credit that his listeners knew enough to know he was bullshitting. The listeners would know he was an owner of the station, said the ABA, and know Telstra was paying Macquarie Radio to sponsor his show. For these reasons, and on balance, the ABA considers that the relevant broadcast was not misleading. So Macquarie Broadcasting was found to have committed no breaches of broadcasting codes and standards. We asked Derek Wilding, director of the Communications Law Centre, which lodged the formal complaint against Macquarie Radio 18 months ago, to assess the ABA's final verdict in the light of the document leaked to Media Watch. A much narrower approach to compliance with the commercial radio standards has been taken in the final report, with less attention to the public interest objects of regulation that might demand enforceable changes in industry practice. Telstra does not pay Jones. It pays Macquarie Radio to sponsor Jones' show. But even the narrow final report of the ABA recognises that Telstra was and is getting value for money here. Last week, we called this cash for comment Mark II. It's a big issue in the industry. But the final report of the ABA recommends no changes to broadcasting standards to protect us from these deals. Giles Tanner told Media Watch the board... ...shied away from any finding. They felt that was a bit of a Pandora's box. Yes, and it's already wide open. Why is the ABA flinching? Who do they think they're dealing with here? Why don't they get to the heart of these deals? The ABA told us the leaking of this report... ...really compromises our ability in future to obtain this kind of information as willingly... ...and to obtain the cooperation of parties as willingly as we've been able to obtain it. Sorry, Giles, we don't buy that. These people aren't your friends... And they're not giving you willing cooperation. You get what you get because there's an act giving you power to demand documents and examine witnesses. They use the law to protect their interests. That's why Macquarie Radio went to the New South Wales Supreme Court this morning to try to stop us giving this inside account of the ABA's half-baked investigation into Jones, Telstra and Macquarie Radio. Until next week, good night. We'll